Boy, this is uh, this is quite a welcome. Thank you so much. Great to be with you. Can sit down. Come on, have a seat here. This is uh, this is terrific. Thanks so very much, Congressman Webster and uh, Congressman Mack, soon to be Senator Mack, right? <laughs> Got to get him elected. This is uh, this is wonderful to be at Con Air today. Uh, they make, as you know, filtration products that go in your furnace. When was the last time you changed the air filter? <laughs> All right, come on, guys, you got to get that job done. Now, by, by the way, if you look carefully, you can see they have spelled out my name in the blue. M I T T. You see that? Oh, these guys have done the job. <laughs> look, look. It, it, it's businesses like this, uh, small businesses that are able to grow and hire people that, that put people back to work. And, uh, and this, by the way, is not a great time for small business. These have been tough years for businesses of all kinds across America. Uh, the president, as you, uh, as you know, said last week that, uh, that the private sector is doing fine. And uh, he is so out of touch with what's happening across America, to say something like that. He went on, of course, this was not just one line taken out of context. He went on to describe why he believes that, therefore, we should provide another stimulus to hire government workers. And uh, it's very clear he does think things are just fine in the, in the private sector, even though, as you know, the, the rate of growth of our economy in the first quarter was only 1.9%. And we have almost 15% of Americans that are out of work or stopped looking for work or way underemployed. I go across the country and I meet people who are, who are struggling. Individuals have lost jobs. I was in Florida, a woman had been out of work for two years looking for a work in, uh, in marketing and consulting as she'd been employed in the past. Uh, I was with a teacher that was out of work and she's looking for an opportunity to get back into the workforce. And just so many people are struggling. I was with a, a fellow uh, here in Florida as well who he works at the YMCA his home is being foreclosed on. And he said, I don't know whether at the end of the day when I go home, whether we'll be able to go into the home or not, or whether it's going to be padlocked. And his wife was due to have their second child on that very day. People across America are having a hard time. The president doesn't understand how his policies have made things so hard for the American people. It's finally time to have a president who's in touch with what's happening in America, and I am, and I'll bring back America's strength. Now, just yesterday, the president said something else that shows just how, to much, how much out of touch he is. He said he didn't understand that Obamacare was hurting small business. He didn't understand that, that Obamacare impacts small business. And you have to scratch your head about that, because about a year ago, the Chamber of Commerce did a survey of some 1,500 small businesses. And of those small businesses, three quarters, 75%, said Obamacare made it less likely for them to hire people. It is having an impact on middle income families that want to have good jobs. We also found out that 30% of employers in this country plan on dropping people once Obamacare is put in place, dropping them from their health care plan. And then there were some other revelations about, about Obamacare. Instead of costing a trillion dollars, it's going to cost two trillion dollars. It's not only bad policy and bad for middle income families and bad for small business, it's simply unaffordable. And so the right course for us is to make sure that the next president of the United States repeals Obamacare and replaces Obamacare. The president needs to get in touch with what's happening in the private sector, what's happening with middle-income families, and the damage that's being done by the specter of Obamacare, and the taxes that it already charges to businesses in the health care sector. Now, I know the Supreme Court is about to make a decision with regards to Obamacare, and I have right here in my pocket what they're going to say. <laughs> Actually, I don't know what they're going to do. Uh, but you know, regardless of what they do, it's going to be up to the next president to either repeal and replace Obamacare or to replace Obamacare. And, uh, and I intend to, to do both if I'm, uh, if I'm the, uh, 
the president at a time when the Supreme Court has left Obamacare in place, I will repeal it on day one by sending out a waiver to all 50 states to keep them from having to pursue Obamacare. able to repeal it, and if, uh, or if the Supreme Court is able to get that job done for us, we want to replace it. And I want to mention to you a number of things I would put in place with which to replace Obamacare. Number one, the uninsured. Right now, the uninsured are cared for at the state level. Each state has its own program for dealing with those that are uninsured. Some send uninsured people to clinics for care. Others send them to emergency rooms. What I would do is keep, as we have today, state responsibility for those that are uninsured. You see, I believe in the Tenth Amendment. I believe the states have responsibility to care for their people in the way they feel best. But to help states care for their own uninsured, I would take the Medicaid dollars that comes with all sorts of strings attached today, send them back to the states, along with something known as the dish money, and let states care for their own people in the way they think best. That, in my view, is the best way to care for the uninsured. And states, states will learn from each other. And some will have good experiences and others will not. That's happening even today. And states are learning and trying new ways to care for the uninsured. It's important for us, in my view, to make sure that every American has access to good health care. There are other things I do. I want to get health care to act more like a consumer market, meaning like the things we deal with every day in our lives, the purchases of, our, of tires, of automobiles, of air filters, of, of all sorts of products. Consumer markets tend to work very well, keep the costs down and the quality up. So how would I do that in health care? Well, right now, most people get their insurance through their employer. And the reason they do that is because their employer gets a tax deduction when they buy insurance for you. But if you're a very small business person, let's say a one-person business, you don't get a tax deduction for buying insurance. And if you're an individual that's not employed, you don't get a tax deduction for, not, for buying your own insurance. What I would do is level the playing field and say individuals can buy insurance on the same tax advantage basis that businesses can buy insurance. I also want to make sure that people can't get dropped if they have a pre-existing condition. What I mean by that? So, so let's say someone has been continuously insured and they develop a serious condition. And let's say they lose their job or they change jobs. They move and they go to a new place. I don't want them to be denied insurance because they've got some pre-existing condition. So we're going to have to make sure that the law we replace Obamacare with assures that people who have a pre-existing condition, who've been insured in the past, are able to get insurance in the future, so they don't have to worry about that condition keeping them from getting the kind of health care they deserve. And I want these individuals and businesses to be able to buy insurance across state lines, get the best deal they can get anywhere in the country, I wanted to be able to join associations of like types of organizations so they can get bargaining power, purchasing power, and get insurance at a reasonable rate. We, we can get health care to act more like a consumer market. And if we do that, and we stop making it like a big government managed utility, we're going to see better prices, lower costs, and better care. It's happened everywhere we've applied consumer market principles. Free enterprise is the way American works. We need to apply that to health care. something else about, about health care, and that's Medicare. Medicare is the health care program, as you know, for our seniors. And the president did something, I think, that surprised a lot of seniors. When they saw the president campaign four years ago, he didn't mention to them that he was planning on cutting Medicare by $500 billion to pay for his health care plan. But that's what he did. 
And so if you have seniors that say, I need someone to protect Medicare, you remind them, this president was the one that cut $500 billion out of Medicare. My plan is to protect and save Medicare, to make sure it's there not just for current seniors, but for future seniors. And my plan is this, I want people to have more choice. I want them to be able to either have traditional government-sponsored Medicare or private sector Medicare provided by various companies and let them make their choices to which one they want. And by the way, higher income people I think should get less help getting Medicare than lower income people. I think we should care for those that need the help most and let them choose the private or public system they prefer. I think choice is the right course in Medicare. Now I want you to know how much I appreciate the vitality and energy and passion that come to our nation because of small business and entrepreneurs who begin businesses and grow businesses and hire people. I like you guys. I like you folks who are starting businesses and are working for small businesses and are taking risks and, and keeping America strong. And you should know what's happened here with this company is happening all over the country. People are coming together, working together to create a better future for themselves and for one another. I was uh, with a uh, young woman who has a business. Uh, she, uh, I asked her how she started her company. She said, well, uh, my husband lost his job and he took a class in upholstering. And she said after that, because she was the better business manager than he, she started a company and she hired him as her first employee. And then, and then she, uh, she went on to hire more people because it's an upholstering company. And she now has 40 people who work with her in this upholstering company. 40 families better off because her husband took that class and she began that business. I met another woman in, uh, in Las Vegas. Her name is, uh, is Debbie Summers. She has a furniture rental company. She rents sofas to casinos and to uh, conventions and so forth that come to Las Vegas. From what I can tell in the warehouse, they're mostly black Naugahyde sofas with black coffee tables. And, um, and the business really took a big dive when President Obama said, to people, don't come to Las Vegas for your company meetings. And they really got hurt. And, uh, and so she wondered how she was going to keep her business and keep the people who'd worked for her together. And she came up with an idea. We're going to learn how to make furniture, not just rent it. And so now they manufacture those sofas and those coffee tables. And they provide them not only to their customers in Las Vegas, but they sell them across the country. And she's been able to hold on to her company and the people who work for her. I see people across this nation that inspire me. I was with a guy who used to work for a, uh, uh, an advertising agency. He lives in St. Louis. And uh, he got tired of working for someone else. He and his son decided to start their own business. And they make amplifiers for electric guitars. They had four employees. They're now down to two. But they still are able to work on their own and to build their enterprise. I met another guy in St. Louis who worked for the city. He was in the Department of Public Works. That meant he did lawns and worked on the streets and so forth. Decided to start his own business in mowing lawns. Now he has 200 people who work with him providing for, for lawn service and care. Th these entrepreneurs that start businesses and people who go to work for those entrepreneurs, they are what make America the economic powerhouse we are. This is what drove our economy. We don't have a central government that tells everybody what they have to do and what business they can participate in. Instead, we let people choose their own course. That, that flowed from our Constitution and also from our Declaration of Independence. The Founders said that we Americans are granted our rights by our Creator, not by the government. And that changed everything. We became the sovereign. those rights, among those rights would be political freedom, the right to choose who would represent us, but also economic freedom. They said we had these rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We would be free to pursue happiness as we choose. That economic freedom is what allowed people to come here from other lands and start businesses regardless of the circumstance of their birth. Their, uh, their achievement knew no bounds in, the, in America. This became the land of entrepreneurs and innovators. 
And that's what drives our economy. Sometimes I don't think the president understands that. I don't think he understands the power of free people pursuing their dreams. I, I love the fact that people come to this country and, and see the opportunity here. I'm disappointed in a president who tries to attack success and divide the American people. I heard Marco Rubio the other day, your senator, he was at a rally. and. Uh, He said, you know, uh, when we came to America and we had our home, very modest home apparently, he said we looked around and saw some very fancy homes. You probably heard him say this. Big cars, people lived extremely well. He said, I never once heard my parents say, I wish we could have some of what they have. I wish they'd give it to us. Instead, they said, aren't we lucky to live in a country where if we work hard and have a little good luck and get a great education, we might be able to achieve that for ourselves. That is the nature of America. We are a free land. And, and the success of people like that, who, who took the risk and achieve a, an enterprise like this one. They don't make us worse off. They make us better off. We welcome and celebrate their successes, compliment them, recognize them. We appreciate the good jobs they create. And yet this president over his last three and a half years has shown a disregard for the power of economic freedom by a whole series of policies that make it harder for people make it harder for people to start businesses, grow businesses, and to hire one another. Obamacare, I mentioned already, is the, is the poster child for a piece of policy that's made it harder for businesses to hire people. That's why we've got to get rid of it, among other good reasons. But there are other things as well. He put in place a big stimulus plan, borrowed almost a trillion dollars, but used it to protect government, not to encourage small businesses to grow and thrive. And then there was something known as Dodd-Frank. You may not be terribly familiar with it, but it's a regulatory bill that regulates banks. And unfortunately, it hasn't had a big impact on the big banks in New York because they have a lot of lawyers and they can work through all those regulations. But smaller banks, community banks, are having a harder and harder time making loans because of all of the obligation. I spoke with one bank leader who said that they now have more government compliance officers than they have loan officers. Even this enterprise was looking hard to get the kind of financing they needed to expand. This Dodd-Frank made it harder for small business to grow and thrive. Then there's the president's energy policies. Anyone think those are helping American business and entrepreneurs and families? No. I, I, I believe the president, well he said the other day he's in favor of all of the above. And I thought, now what does he mean by that? Because all of the above typically means oil, coal, natural gas, as well as renewables like solar and wind. And then it hit me, because even though he's put a moratorium on drilling in the Gulf, hasn't been willing to drill in Anwar, hasn't drilled in the Outer Continental Shelf, has made it harder to get natural gas by virtue of trying to have the federal government regulate the technology that gets natural gas out of the ground, made it harder to get coal or use coal, I figured out what he means by all of the above. He likes the energy that comes from above the ground, and not from the stuff that comes from below the ground. All right, I like oil, coal, gas, renewables. I want above and below the ground. I want to get America energy secure. By the way, I love this young man in the front row here. All right, this guy here, you think he's my brother, but he's just my friend. I, um, I also see a president who who hasn't taken advantage of one of the great resources America has. We're a very productive people. We make more stuff per person than almost any other nation on earth. And what that means is it's good for us to trade with other nations. And we have some neighbors nearby where trading with them will be very good for us and for them. Latin America. I want to open up new markets for American goods and send our products around the world. In the last uh, three and a half years, China, 
and the European nations have put together some 44 different trade agreements, opening up markets for them around the world. Guess how many trade agreements this president has negotiated over the last three and a half years? Zip. Zero. Yeah, you got the right number there. I, I, want, to op I want to take advantage of the fact that we're proximate to places that want to buy our goods in Latin America and around the world. My, my view is this. The president is so out of touch with the needs of the American people and so out of touch with the power of free enterprise and economic freedom that he doesn't understand how his policies have hurt the American people. I do. I want to change those policies, and I believe if we do, you're going to see an economic resurgence in this country that's going to surprise the world and convince every parent that the future is brighter for their children even than it's been for them. I, I say that because I know what we can do. If we finally balance our budget and rein in the size of the federal government, get rid of Obamacare, and if we take advantage of our energy resources, if we look at regulators and regulations to say how do they not only catch the bad guys but encourage the good guys, make it easier for businesses to grow, if we open up new trade for our goods around the world, if we do these things, our economy is going to come roaring back. And I want to preside over that kind of an economy, not the one the President's leading us to. This President's leading us to become Europe, and Europe doesn't work in Europe. I don't want the high unemployment and the low wage growth and the crisis that they're having in Europe. I want to get America strong again. And the, the consequence of the choices we're making, the consequence is extraordinary. It's good jobs for the people of America, for the middle class of America. It's a bright future for our kids. But it's also something important about the world. I, I was with uh, some leaders of Great Britain, the former Prime Minister there, Tony Blair, and, and David Cameron, current Prime Minister, and other leaders of Great Britain. One of them said this to me. He said, Mitt, if you're lucky enough to be elected president and you travel around the world, as you visit various capitals, you will undoubtedly have rehearsed for you mistakes they think America's making. But please don't ever forget this. What we all fear the most is a weak America. American strength, military strength, economic strength, the strength of our values, those things are the best ally peace has ever known. We need a strong America for a free world. right here in the front row, a, a, a gentleman who has a hat that says, Korean War veteran, forever proud. I was, uh, I was honored to be in. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. I was honored to be in San Diego on Memorial Day, and, uh, and there were a lot of vets there on that uh, celebration. A, a number from the Second World War, Korea, Vietnam, and the most recent conflicts. I introduced several of them, uh, three of them. One of them uh, was the uh, lookout on the USS Tennessee on Pearl Harbor Day. And, uh, and he says his eyes locked onto the eyes of the pilot bringing in the armament that would attack our ships. He was injured in that attack, but went on to serve in the U.S. Navy for 33 years. And the audience stood and, uh, and applauded and recognized his service of our nation. The, uh, the members of the greatest generation are getting fewer and older. They don't stand up quite as fast as they used to. And they can't hold the torch quite as high as they used to. It's time for us to seize that torch, that torch of freedom and hope and opportunity. It's not America's torch. But it's America's duty and honor to hold that torch. It's time for us to lift it high with strongest values, with the strongest economy in the world, with the greatest abundance of freedom 
and with a military that is second to none. I love this country. I love America. We're going to keep it strong with your help. Let's win in November. Thanks so very much.